Welcome to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Kim is a psychotherapist and executive director of ICU Talks, a mental health speaking ministry. This is a podcast about how to flip your lid and learning how to reconnect to who you really are. All right, Flip Your Lid audience. I got a real live, really special person with us today. And so let me tell you about Elise Howell. She has her MA. She's also a licensed clinical mental health counselor. And she's a counselor right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. She earned her MA in Christian counseling from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And she practices at Southeast Psych, where she's also a member of the leadership team. At least specializes in working with women and teen girls and their journeys navigating trauma, disordered eating, and anxiety. She's received training in EMDR and internal family systems therapy to help clients thrive after trauma by reconnecting with their true identities free from shame and burdens of the past. At least also supports women in rediscovering their voice and strengths in the midst of life transitions and difficult relational patterns. Her mission is to help women reclaim their worthiness and set healthy boundaries and leave behind patterns of perfectionism, people-pleasing, and self-doubt. She loves to incorporate spirituality and creative exercises into the healing process. When she's not in session, she's happy as hiking, taking a dance class, or napping on the beach. So will y'all please help me welcome Elise Howell to Flip Your Lid. Thank you so much, Kim. I'm Hi, excited thanks for to being be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So yeah. I'm gonna throw this out first. So if this, if you're a man and you're listening to this, this is still for you. Just like when Andrew was here and he specializes in men being sexually healthy, there's still a message in that for women. And so if you're a man and you're stumbled upon this, stay tuned, stay yeah. tuned. It applies to you as well, especially if you have women in your life that you love and you might get some insight today to help them to be more whole and connected to themselves. So. So, Elise, hi. Hi. <laughs> so, I got to ask you the first question. You know, we're going to just going to yes. jump out there. And whether you want to answer this personally, professionally, or both, let's just see where you want to go with this. All right. So, here's the question. Okay. Please share with us what event or events or life experiences happened to you that caused you to flip your lid? And what measures have you had to take to reconnect to who God says that you really are? This is a hard question because I feel like there's so many things right? <laughs> that have flipped my lid. Um, but no, and I knew you were going to ask this. And so I was thinking about, you know, what are the, what have been the most important ones? Um, and, and so first, I think the first one, and, and I've heard people share this on your podcast as well, is when, when I accepted Jesus as yeah. my savior, that was a huge lid flipping mm. um, time for me. I was a teenager and I was raised Catholic. So I very much knew I knew religion. I knew God. I knew about the Bible and Jesus. Um, but as a teenager, discovered his personal, um, his personal desire to know me and be my savior mm-hmm. and um, and and my my worthiness. And and you know, I'm sure you're familiar with with the Catholic Church. There's so much emphasis on performance, and yes. and there's so, there's a lot that I still appreciate about Catholicism and and find a lot of meaning in it. Um, but, but I think at that time in my life really needed to know, know God in a more personal way. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then I think since then he has been continually trying to show me that he's way more interested in my heart (laughs) and how I'm doing as a person Mm -hmm. than all of my performing that I'm constantly trying to do, (laughs) um, instead. So so that, um, that was a time when my lid was flipped and, um, and reconnecting at that time, it was connecting with who God, who God said that I was really mm-hmm. for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and, and around that time too. So big, a big part of my story, and this is part of my family story, but my story was my sister. Um, she had an eating disorder and we, we were a family with, we stayed in our heads. We were, yeah. um, but we all had big emotions. <laughs> and, and so um, walking, walking that story with her flipped my lid a lot of times because mm. we were in the same environment, even struggling with some of the same things. Like I had my own struggles with body image and food, but never, never got to that point. And, 
got me so curious about, you know, why, why are we taking these two different roads? And, and that ultimately led me to study psychology and just, um, I mean, I've always been curious about people in the brain and why we do the things we do and why, why we pursue, um, certain pathways of healing, some that are helpful, some that aren't helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that, that's a huge part of my story. And, um, Yes, yeah, so so it's just the idea that you're in the same environment. Are you and your sister close in age? Yes, and there's actually, I have an older brother and sister too, so. Do we talk yeah. about them? Are they cool enough to talk about? Yeah, they're all cool okay. to talk about. Older I love people? Them. Okay, all yeah. right, yeah. all right. Great. Yeah. Yeah, so there's four of y'all, pretty tight-knit family. Yes, very tight-knit. Yeah. Like, yeah. great. We always had this tight-knit, close feel, but at the same time, we, we didn't really know each other. Yeah, isn't that know. interesting how that happens, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And is that part of how you got so into learning about the conditioned self and figuring out how to make yes. it personal and all that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Learning um, the conditioned self, like who we who we think we should be, versus mm-hmm. who who we really are. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think I think all of my siblings, we've had conversations about how we grew up with, and me personally, like grew up with shoulds and trying to. Um, trying to perform and being rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, and we knew the right thing to do, but maybe not always what was good for us. We like lack that wisdom, wisdom of our body, wisdom of our emotions. Yeah. Um, If that makes sense. Oh, it does. And you know, whatever you praise a child for, they'll think that's their identity. Yeah. Right. And that's how we become so performative. And, And the shame and blame you brought up as well, that locks us in to behavior instead of character. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's, I love the way that you put that. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. And I think, and our parents are, they are like, there's no, there's nothing that, nothing bad that happened. I think and our parents taught us a lot about caring for other people, but there was such an emphasis on the other. Yes. And a denial of self that is, which is a very classic Catholic yes. position of this. Yes. I... I'm not going to think of myself to the point where it might hurt you because right. you ignore your body, you ignore red flags, you ignore the wisdom that God gave you <laughs> um, and giving you feelings um, and and walk through, walk into situations that might not be healthy for you. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. to me, that's just, I uh, appreciate you saying that perfect segue and just really starting to understand people pleasing and, and codependency yeah. walk from being close to your sister and watching her walk, like how do you support somebody not become codependent? How do you yes. know the difference between enabling and, and helping? And then so many of us, with through being Catholic or Southern Christian, whatever it is, particularly as women, which I know is part of you especially, yeah. really get the message that self-neglect is something to be revered. Yes. And to be upheld. And in that it becomes about giving, not receiving. And at some point within that emotional need drought, there will become some addiction. There will become codependency. There will become mm-hmm. eating disorder, drug addiction. S- something has to come from that because there's so much self-neglect. Yes. Um, that you're looking for something to to help you regulate because there's not the core sense of, I know who I am. I know right what I'm feeling and what I need. <laughs> right. And absolutely. I feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Cause this is one of the things I see so much is that people come in, they've been married. They could be single. Doesn't matter. But I'm just going to mm-hmm. about married people for a second. They've been married for 10 years. And I say, so tell me your number one emotional need and tell me your wife's most, number one emotional need. And they can't answer either. It's like a foreign language. Mm-hmm. And, Relationships are based on the level of connections based on emotional needs. And we are we are not talking about that or teaching it or putting a spotlight on it at all. What no. is that about? What is that about? Yeah, um, why, why are we so yeah. against talking about emotional needs? I think so many of us aren't connected yeah. to them in the first place. <laughs> we don't know we have them. And so then we're not passing that on to our kids. But it's mm-hmm. it's vulnerable. Mm-hmm. to talk about your emotional need. Mm-hmm. Um, if you say, I have this need, 
there's that fear I might be rejected. And that goes back right. to our childhood right. That's right. Um, and, and the wounds that we might be carrying. So I think we, I think people, they push those, you know, they push those wounds aside and want to move on and not think about them and right. ignore their, they start ignoring their emotional needs to survive. Yeah. Um, and then that's passed down and, um, you know, about trauma that it's, it's, we pass down cycles and then that's mm-hmm. passed down and, and their kids aren't learning about their emotional needs. Um, yeah, I yeah. think, I think what you're highlighting is so important because so many times when someone has like a great family, like you do, yeah. it doesn't mean that the trauma of rejection is not present. Yes. So when you don't have something to point to, you can't point to a divorce. You can't point to a molestation. People don't understand the significance of when needs are neglected and you're constantly doing things to not be rejected out of your fear of being rejected, like you, you're still locked into a trauma. Yes. So again, that's part of where behavior has to come in because you're doing anything and everything to not be rejected. Yes. Yes. I talk about that. I talk about that with clients a lot. They're like, well, nothing, my parents didn't do anything wrong. Right. Like they, they tried the best they could. And I was like, but there was, there was misattunement and attune, emotional right. attunement is so important. Like yeah. they weren't, they weren't on the same page with you, what you were feeling. And mm-hmm. when you're so young and, and I, um, with eating disorders, I use a lot of emotion focused family therapy. Mm-hmm. And so that's the emotion focused couples ther- therapy, but taken and used with families. Um, and, and they talk so much about how in, important it is, especially when we're young to, to have our emotions validated and mm-hmm. to know, to have somebody speak what we're feeling and why, because that's giving us emotional language. That's helping yeah. our neurons. Yes. Our neurons are firing when we hear people talk mm-hmm. about our feelings and make sense of them. And so yeah. when we, um, when that doesn't happen, we we're left guessing <laughs> right. and, and, and maybe assume there's something wrong with us because we have these feelings and other people aren't seeing it. And when you're right. a kid, it's, your world, you see the world through your eyes and it's easier to assume there's something wrong with me, not my caregivers. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So that's how that, no, nothing bad happened to you, but you, Mm -hmm. you weren't validated. You didn't feel your emotions, maybe, maybe you felt rejected and Mm -hmm. um, you then felt this need to perform to try to, you know, earn, earn some sense of worthiness that I'm seeing that I'm heard. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's the absolute truth that that you know parents are called to like help regulate a child's emotion yes. and and so you must be disappointed that's happening. You're not gonna take away the child's disappointment, you're regulating that, you put a name on it so they know what they're experiencing. And when it doesn't happen, we just really get stuck. And again, it it comes out behaviorally at some point because you don't yes. know it's okay to have the feelings. You don't know that you don't you don't get through the moment. Yes. Right. It gets stuck in the tunnel. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you give everyone an example of what emotionally focused therapy with an eating disorder patient looks like an example of that? Yes. So eating disorders, eating disorder treatment is tough, especially in the initial stages, because you are you're fighting against the eating disorder, which has some people don't realize it has its own voice in a person. Mm-hmm. It's separate from them. Mm-hmm. And there is so much, there's like the eating disorder is all of the emotion. Maybe this person has held in and hasn't expressed (laughs) like, yeah. And it is so afraid of being shut down. So when you're introducing food again into somebody's life and sharing with them, like, you and not sharing, usually you have to be pretty firm. Like you need to be eating and you're coaching parents and helping. So I'm coaching the parents really in the initial phases, phases and helping them help their child eat. Mm -hmm. And so, and then when they're doing that, they're getting huge pushback from the eating disorder, lots of emotion. And so in order to get any inroads, you have to validate and use that emotion focused language to first meet your kid, um, meet your kid where, where they are. I understand that you are terrified of eating because you're going to, you feel like you're going to lose control. And this has been the one thing that Mm -hmm. has given that you felt you've had control over in this chaotic season of your life. 
when we went through a move and, and you lost your grandma, like, so this having to practice this really, um, really emotion focused language to get into their world, help put out the fire in their brain, because when they feel seen, the eating disorder is like, Oh, okay. Somebody, somebody hears me. And that, that's, that's that your kids also experiencing that validation, um, for this, for the first time, maybe in this process. So, um, so in eating disorder, the, and the model I practice from, it's working a lot with the parents first to help them validate model, um, model that emotional expression, help show, show the teen they are or, or child that they are trying to understand what's happening in their mind and that they're, they're not the only person that's feeling that sees that there's a problem and that things aren't okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's just powerful words you're using because it is a Ed. We call it eating disorder, Ed. In case you don't know, yes, yeah. I know you know that. I mean, like the yes. audience, first. Anna, yeah, yeah. Yep. Sorry. that um, that with Ed or Anna or Mia, that it is a voice for someone who doesn't have, yes. just like alcoholism becomes a voice. Yes, right, and it's so paradoxical because it gives life and then it almost kills you. And for some yes. people, that it does kill. Right, yeah. and so what have you seen? Because it's such a serious disorder. And we do think teenage girl, but that's not true. That's not, that's no. not the whole story, is it? No. Um, and for me, for me, I work mostly with, with teenage girls and, and, and with adult women too. And then the treatment's a little different, but um, there is such a need for males who have eating disorders mm-hmm. um, and athletes. And, and it's not just, it's not just people who are small bodied. I think that we have this perception that, um, it's only that and there's, you know, the petite white female who might be mm-hmm. struggling, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that the majority of people who have eating disorders do not fit that. Right. That's right. Fit that description. And so, yeah. um, there's definitely people who are flying under the radar who aren't receiving services. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, yeah. Yeah. And just to think, you know, because there's orthoanorexia is big orexia, you probably know the terms even more than I do. I mean, there's compulsive eating, there's disorder eating versus like, there's so many, it's so broad. It needs to be. Yes. Right. Because it, it is, it becomes, it doesn't look the same on everybody. No, no, no eating disorder or disorder, no disordered eating pattern is the same. Yeah. And, and somebody can come in with a combination of, of several. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, so what would be your suggestion to people I'm very delicate if I see someone in, I don't talk about people's weight, period, honestly. Yeah. and I, Or, yeah. or what's, how much someone eats in the moment, whatever else. Like, we have to be very careful with that. Good, good. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. just your knowledge, just the knowledge you would give our audience about if you see somebody, because if you say to somebody, wow, you look like you lost weight, you look great, they may be purging six times a day. Yeah. So yes. what are different words or different ways of approaching people, whether you're just complimenting them or you're actually concerned that's yeah we don't we don't want to comment on on people's bodies right like that's <laughs> that is not not okay and it's a very private thing mm-hmm. um so but sometimes like when somebody appears very confident like you see your friend and you're like oh my gosh she looks great I hate that sometimes weight is the first thing we go to oh right. she must have lost weight yeah and so comment on something else not the weight but maybe the energy that you feel that she has mm. or he has and I'm just going with she because I'm right in my world and yeah. my friends right. um make a remark about wow like you feel so you feel so confident and mm-hmm. um there's something there's something different about you how are you how are you doing you seem to be doing really well and yeah. and and maybe then they'll share no I'm not actually that's interesting you say that because right. <laughs> I'm really struggling yeah. or maybe they maybe they they are doing great and they've been um, working on taking care, taking care of themselves and breaking free from patterns and mm-hmm. emotionally are in a really healthy place. And you mm-hmm. see that freedom and how they're carrying themselves. Um, or if you're trying to express concern, I think we don't have to use the body as a jumping off point. Mm. Um, you can instead just notice, Hey, something, something seems off. Yeah. You seem, you seem more, more tired is 
like they're, you're carrying a burden. Mm. What's, what's going on? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that, language is important. Yeah. Language is very important. Um, mm. That might open a door that there's less shame when you're mm. not talking about their body directly, where they might be less defensive, honestly. Right. Um, if you come at it more from an emotional, emotional window mm-hmm. or door rather than physical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's really great advice. I think about a relative of mine who is very much in a binge disorder and, mm. you know, so it's evident that he has, yeah. he's in an addiction. Yeah. And so none of us are going to say anything to him because you don't comment on someone's weight, but he eats the way I drink. Mm. Right. And mm-hmm. so it is, it is showing us that he's in pain and none of us know how to approach that. Mm. Right. Because if there's so much shame involved, opposed to saying, Hey, you're drinking too much. Yeah. It's very different to say to somebody, hey, it looks like. You're in pain. Yeah. And so it's about having the words of how do you approach someone correctly. Yeah. And lovingly and not add shame. Because if you're already in a disorder, you already are. It's a, that's a byproduct of the shame. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's that like language and the emotional language we use can. And sometimes it's just such small tweaks. Mm. But it can be a huge difference because one thing might convey judgment or shame to somebody right. and another conveys understanding, acceptance. Um, and coming coming back to your question about flipping your lid and how, do it, how did I reconnect with who God mm. says I am, I think a huge way I continually reconnect is being with safe people and yeah. speaking about the things I feel ashamed about yeah. and, and, and realizing I'm okay. Yeah, <laughs> And so I think when the language we use, how we talk to people, if they know we're safe, mm-hmm. that's going to help them reconnect with themselves, yeah. relax, mm-hmm. um, and be a little, and be able to open up about what, what is weighing them down with what, what they mm-hmm. are struggling with. Yeah. Safety is so key. Yes. So can you talk about the support? Because, you know, as an alcoholic, there's 370 AA meetings in Charlotte a week. Yeah. And so if I go to one, it's unhealthy. I don't have to go back to it. And but when it comes to support groups for eating disorders, there there is a lot of learning that happens in a very negative way. Yeah. There's a lot of websites and different things that people are learning yeah. ways to be sicker, not yeah. better. And that can happen in any addiction or any disorder, but I see it happen more with disordered eating than anything else. Yes. Yes, there's a competitiveness to eating disorders that yeah. makes makes the group work in the early stages fairly tricky. Um, mm. And most groups happen within the context of higher level of care right. um, initially, right. um, because somebody's being somebody's being monitored more closely, and they're less likely to have an opportunity to maybe act on something they heard about in group. Yeah. Um, but it's, and, and I don't want to talk about anything specifically. Um, right, right. Yeah, in this context. But, um, but so the group, the group work is difficult. And um, I think so much, that's, I think that's why so much of eating disorder work is family-based. I think a huge part is feeling safe, re, mm-hmm. reestablishing safety in the family again mm-hmm. for that, that person to be able to, say how they're feeling, find their voice in a healthy way and not need the eating disorder yeah. as their voice. Um, and, and that's in, in my work and in, in my practice, focus on the family as the group. Um, I don't know. Right. If, yeah. That we're, we're trying to help reduce shame there. Right. And Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And when the person's in a more stable place, then I think the opportunity for group work I might send somebody, maybe there's sexual trauma that's involved in the development of the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. A trauma support group might be more appropriate than an eating disorder support group, but getting them group support maybe for another co-occurring issue that's going on, um, that, that could be a different route than, than an eating disorder group. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And even going back to what we talked about earlier is people's identity becomes, what you praise them for. So if you're praising someone consistently mm-hmm. for how they look. Yes. 
then it it becomes identity and it makes it much harder. And we we have a personal responsibility of how we interact with people and the value we place on how someone looks and the implicit bias we have towards how someone looks. And I think that's part of why people have a hard time separating from the eating disorder being their identity is if we've praised them and made it about how they look so much, yes. then it's, it's so entangled. Yeah. Yes, that, um, all right, we're all looking for or something, right? That right. something to identify with that where we know, I think I lost my train of thought so we can maybe edit this, edit this part okay. out. <laughs> totally, totally got lost. Okay. Um, I don't, I just want to go back and speak about eating disorder specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah. That an eating disorder, it is, it is an identity and something that people are praised for. And I think, mm-hmm. Um, we see it a lot in, with people who are perfectionists, like that this is something, this is something I can get right. And maybe I'm not feeling good about other areas of my life, but in this area, um, I'm receiving praise. I know that if I do, and I'm not going to say specifically, but I do X, Y, and Z today, Mm -hmm. then I have, I have performed well and I have a good day, Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're seeking it there because they're not getting that in their environment for whatever, whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you saying that. Do yeah. you see any correlation between eating disorders and, and people pleasing? Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah. Um, so people, and I'll just say, speak to what people pleasing is. I mean, I think a lot of us know what it is and it's kind of inherent in the, mm, the definition. It's good to define. Yeah. yeah. It's when we, we look to make other people happy and put their, put their needs and emotions above, above our own. And, um, and I think with, with eating disorders, sometimes, um, sometimes uh, I'm getting, I'm getting all mixed up. (laughs) You're doing great. Um, You're doing great. Yeah. Um, I got to think about this one for a second. Um, yeah, I think I think with people pleasing, um, you know, somebody somebody isn't taking care of themselves, or they're so worried about what other people think. Mm-hmm. They, um, they're ignoring, and we've t- kind of talked about, spoken to this already. They're ignoring their, they're ignoring their emotions, and and maybe what, um, and they're seeking approval. Really, mm-hmm. like people pleasing is a, is it's based on fear of man, like seeking approval of others mm-hmm. rather than being grounded, grounded in self. Right. And so there's a lack of, there's a lack of confidence, (laughs) Um, a lack of the ability to, there's a lack of connection with one's worthiness. I think Mm -hmm. both with people pleasing and with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and maybe, maybe they're trying to control everything else in there. Maybe their environment is chaotic. They're trying to, to please and control everything in the environment. And the eating disorder is a place where they, they are finding control and regulating. Right. Um, so, so it's connected to, I think, people-pleasing, trauma, codependency. Right. Yeah. It's, by definition, is people-pleasing different than codependency? Yes. What would the well, difference be, you think? Yeah. That's what I think. I'm curious to know what you think, too. <laughs> okay. Um, I, think, I think people, we can we can be people pleasers without being kind of entrenched in a codependent cycle with somebody. Um, and, and I think people like if you struggle with people pleasing, you still could have healthy boundaries and not, you can kind of go back and forth. You you might not, you know, Mm -hmm. always be looking at what, um, it might not be enabling, other right. people, so to speak. Yeah. And I think with codependency, there's that, there's that, um, there's the context where you might be enabling consistent 
consistent behavior or addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people pleasing can be more isolated. That's how right. what I don't know. How do you how do you see it? I'm curious. Well, I, I, I'm with you on that. I view yeah. people pleasing as alcohol abuse and uh, codependency yeah. is alcoholism, right? Like it's on those mm-hmm, levels. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so you, because you can go from people pleasing to codependency, yes. right? But once you're codependent, you can't go back to people pleasing. Like you're going to, unless yeah. you just have to get recovery. Yes. And so there's such a loss of self. And so um, I put on Facebook and it's probably been a couple of years. It was before we were all fighting on Facebook, but I started a big fight on Facebook before it was cool to fight. Oh, yeah. I'm so, proud of, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> all I said was, People pleasing is a form of manipulation. Mm. And the comments and the people defending and the people who this, the Southern Christian women who got slapped by that comment, it was a great, healthy conversation, but really healthy. But it is because if I'm altering what I'm going to do for you or my answer, or I'm going to decide for you or do something for you because I don't know how to be honest with you. I'm manipulating yes. what's going to happen next. It's dishonest. Yeah. People pleasing and codependency are both forms of dishonesty, yes. but they come a lot of times from trauma. It yes. comes from a conditioned self and it's all you know to do until you get better. Yes. And it's, there's a, it's controlling. They can be controlled. Like you're trying to control an outcome and people right. pleasing. That's yeah. Right. yeah. It's just manipulation. So, yeah. Right? No, and it's dishonest. No, I am with you. Yeah. And so people had such a hard time hearing that and, and, and yeah. could, but and there's situations where it is okay. Like if you're a codependent married to a narcissist, because narcissistic people will find the codependents, yeah. they will find yeah. them in a heartbeat. You need to answer in certain ways to prevent what's going to happen next. Yes. It is. You are in survival brain. You need to be in survival brain until you work with some professionally to be able to escape yes. what you are in. And so there are times it's okay. Yes. Um, but it's, it is, Overall, people's fear of being rejected, and that is how they go into people pleasing. Yeah, I think one of the hardest parts of trauma work is walking with somebody. First, you have to help them feel safe, right? Like when you speak Mm -hmm. of that dynamic where you have a codependent who's been with a narcissist, they need to feel safe, they need to validate their emotions, they need to reconnect. Yeah, I think it's very delicate to walk walk the road with them to where they can look start to look at their own behavior at some point, mm-hmm. like moving from that. Um, do you know Cartman's triangle? The yeah, I was, I was yeah. going to bring that up. I call it the yeah. codependent triangle, but yeah. it's really yeah. called Cartman's triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So moving out of, moving out of that victim mindset, but mm-hmm. without, um, but I think people have to go through their process of reconnecting at first and asserting their voice. Right. But then recognizing, okay, there, I was hurt. And, not but, and I could also play a role in manipulation as well. Right. That's right. Does that, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, you know, the, the Cartman's Triangle is, just in case you want to look it up on YouTube, it's it's really simple but fascinating. And it just explains mm-hmm. so much about whether all three positions are victim, but there's victim, rescuer, perpetrator. And you can vacillate through all three. Like yeah. if you're driving and all of a sudden you're cussing someone out because they cut you out. Like you're the you're the perpetrator at that point, right? Yeah. The next minute you're the rescuer and letting three people over in line to get get something right, or someone cuts you off and you go into the victim role of this yeah. always happens to me. So mm-hmm. so just know all of us can go into those roles, but we're called to be an empowered self. We're called to be a connected self, and so that we don't have to go to any type of victim stance. And to get out of victimization means we have to be responsible. Yes, it doesn't Take mean it. what you're going through is your fault. Yeah. responsibility and blame are very different things, but we yes. take responsibility if we're going to get better. Yes. Taking responsibility for your emotions yeah. and your boundaries and what you need. <laughs> yeah. And so for codependents, yeah. taking responsibility for a boundary is like, they think they have a better chance of running five marathons in one day. Yeah. Than yeah. setting a boundary. Than setting a boundary. Yes. Yeah, it's ter- It's very uncomfortable and terrifying right. because they're saying in that moment that they matter. Yes, like they're fighting against this issue with shame and yeah. saying that they are in agreement with God that they actually matter. When you have a boundary, you're in agreement with God that you matter. Yes, that my my thoughts, my feelings, my body, who I am, has boundaries. A place where I mm-hmm. I stop, like or I start. Nobody else can can enter right. that boundary. All right. 
Yeah. Well, and this is all so related to eating disorders because if you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the mm-hmm. bottom level, very simple. You know, we're talking food, shelter, sleep. And so then it's about being safe and secure. And then it goes into boundaries, which means if you're safe and secure, you have a voice, you have boundaries, you'll have a sense of belonging, you have a sense of importance, et cetera. If you get knocked off that triangle, you land at the bottom. Yeah. And that's where food and sleep come in. It's why all of a sudden you'll, 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 all you'll do is eat or you won't eat. All you'll do is sleep or you won't sleep. Yeah. And so it all very much ties into safety. To safety. Basic needs. Yeah. Yeah. And our basic needs. Yeah. 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 When I think in, in trauma work, safety, that has just become such a, like, I'm coming back to that all the time now. Yeah. Since I, since I did the EMDR training and IFS training, mm-hmm. um, that helping people, helping people find safety, whether I'm working with trauma, eating disorder, anxiety, like that has become yeah. the number one thing for me yeah. as a therapist. Yeah, yeah. It, it is crucial. And in, in especially with polyvagal theory, I think it puts safety mm-hmm. even in a better, for me, perspective mm-hmm. of understanding what it really means to be in ventral vagal, be safety and connection. Because we are safe in disconnection. Yeah. We're really comfortable in disconnection. Yeah. Right. Well, our, our body adapts to, it's like, and our body doesn't like whatever it feels different. So safety right. at first feels mm-hmm. uncomfortable. And that's yeah. why some people, if they're used to chaos, you know, they go stirring up, stirring yeah. up chaos again right. when they're trying that's to right. get safe. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I think it's a great point you just made for those who are codependent because you're going to, if you go around people, you're looking for that person you have to solve their needs for. So you'll go to someone chaotic. You'll go to the narcissist. Yeah. You'll go to somebody, you know, who um, can't self-regulate and wants you to regulate for them. Yes. Yeah, very much. Yeah. And that's why it's so important for us to get safe and ground and learn um, learn to be in our bodies so that we don't, we're not at risk for re-traumatization. Mm-hmm. And we don't seek mm-hmm. out those environments again where we have experienced trauma. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and even teaching people how to get in their bodies. I love for you to give an example of that. And I'll tell the yeah. story real quick that a therapist, she, all she did, all she did was look at me and, she say, and said um, that you're not breathing. Uh-huh. And you would have thought she punched me in the throat because I was like, <laughs> why are you looking at me? Why are you staring at me? All right. But really, it, the threat was awareness of my body. Yeah. Because I live neck, to, neck up. Mm-hmm. And just that was the start of a journey of learning what it really means to be body conscious and safe in your own body and the body not to be the enemy. Yes. Yeah. So um, I love, and, and one of my favorite parts of EMDR is, so you do, are, are you familiar with EMDR? I'm certified in EMDR. I'm not oh, a fan awesome. personally. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm a That's huge a fan of internal family systems. Um, Richard Schwartz trained me in IFS. Oh, my and gosh. so, yeah, I love IFS. I just, EMDR bores me. Okay. But I'm a fan, I'm a fan of it for other people. Yeah. I under, no, I understand. Like there are, I couldn't do that every session. Right. Because there, it's, it's extremely helpful for clients, but there's, it's less engaging. I think for us, it's, it's less engaging. Yes. Yes. That's a nicer way of putting it than me saying I'm bored. Yes. That's a much nicer, <laughs> better way. So good job. Someone, Someone yeah. says I'm great at reframing things, so <laughs> that's engaging. Well, I just told you I'm Enneagram 8, so like I just True. say things. And True. so you reframed it very well, so thank you. Yes. Um, so no, with, with EMDR, I love the body scan because that's, a, that's at the end of the process. But mm-hmm. So we've gotten through some of the core beliefs. We've helped process the visual, the memory content from the trauma. But usually at the end, somebody's still having these feelings in their body and like they'll yeah. notice, all right, I'm, I'm holding my hands like this every time you're asking me to think about the memory. Like, yeah. and if I, for people who can't see me, I'm like clenching my hands, like in a, in a fist in front of me, like hands folded and, and kind of like, what does that mean? And then we do the eye movements. And so bringing awareness to the certain movements we have in, in different situations that means something. What does it mean that your leg is shaking right now? Exactly. What is it? Exactly. What does it mean that you've been, picking at your hands the whole session. Yeah. Um, and that usually tells tells us something about a client's sense of safety. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and and what, what they're struggling with in that, um, 
with people in terms mm-hmm. of like, I don't feel I can. And, and so with one client, the, you know, the hands, it was a sign of, of weakness that she couldn't speak. She couldn't speak up or say what she wanted. And, mm-hmm. and she was just kind of like just holding on to, to yeah. make it through, make it through the situation. And, um, and then that, that opened up a whole conversation about how do we help her? How do, what does she need then to speak right. up and, and do it differently and, and then take an open posture and drop her hands and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all of a sudden relax and feel more powerful in that. Yeah that situation. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, we, our body has perfect memory. And so a leg yeah. shaking can be someone with what they're talking about. They wanted to have movement at that time and they couldn't. Yes. So as a therapist to not notice it, to not comment on it, like we're missing so much, so much, so many avenues to go down to help people go to what's really going on with them. Yes. Yeah. It can be yeah. as simple as well, what is your, what are your hands telling you? Right. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be something very complicated. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. No, Um, it's really, really true. What's been the most surprising thing or aspect for you when it comes to working with trauma? I, my gut reaction, like my, my first thought is just how resilient, like the resilience that's there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think, and this is, I think it just me, I'm a, I can be a more risk averse person. And so when I'm with a client, I'm very, and, and this comes from my background, I'm very in tune with like, I don't want to, I don't want to push too much. <laughs> mm. Like, and that, um, but no, it's just like amazing to see how much clients can handle and yeah. um, and what they can face in a session yeah. and then leave your office and, and that that has actually helped them move through it. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that that has surprised me a lot, mm-hmm. just the, the resilience that's there. And we know it from the research, but then to mm-hmm. experience with my clients, mm-hmm. um, they're their resilience and in, in walking into some really, really, really tough emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just how um, I think I'm continually struck by like going into the process, how much they'll say they, they can't do it. Like they don't know what they need. Right. And then in that process, like they're the ones who start to all of a sudden it's like they find that they find their voice and they're like, they're speaking. Oh, well, um, that wasn't my fault because I was only five years old. And how could I have expected, mm-hmm. how could I have expected a five-year-old to protect herself in that situation? Right. And to watch them move from at the start of trauma therapy, not being, not having that awareness to getting their entire, like, they are getting there on their own. I am not giving them those words. So right. Right. To, that, that always amazes me that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, a beautiful thing to, get yeah. to be a part of with people. Yes. Yeah. So I had a, an amazing, beautiful person say to me recently that three things about trauma, and I'm a trauma-informed therapist, but I just never heard it framed this way. Yeah. So I want to h- get your reaction to this, that when you're dealing with trauma, especially with sexual abuse, that the person doesn't want to remember it, talk about it, or heal from it. Mm-hmm. And so it struck me, but the last part, not wanting to heal from it, struck me. But then I had to think about it. It really is true. I don't want to heal. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have any memory of it. And I don't want to have to face it, which is why I don't want to heal. It's not that I don't want to heal. I don't want to have to go through the process Yes. to get to the healing and helping yes. somebody. Give, give us some words about how you're helping someone know. Because this is a really slow process Yeah. when you're dealing with trauma. Yes. Um. I like to, I think it's important to educate people first. I like to educate, start with like the neurobiology. This is why, this is why you're stuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, and, and I think if there are listeners who are trauma therapists, they would know this, or if they're, they're just geeks about the brain, that trauma mm-hmm. is stored maladaptively in the brain right. in a way that, um, our our brains get stuck feeling like we're still in a place of unsafety. Mm -hmm. And so 
starting by explaining to clients, you know, this isn't your fault, right? Like, and this is what's happening in your brain. I think that helps disarm them a little bit. Like, okay, Mm -hmm. like you understand there's actually a reason why I'm having flashbacks. This isn't just some messed up thing that's not understandable or not possible to move Mm -hmm. through. Because I think, I think some people who don't, who come in and they don't understand why they're experiencing what they're experiencing, they feel like there's no way through it, right? They think right. that it feels, it feels insurmountable to walk yeah. into to the healing process and giving them, so first explaining to them like what has happened, why they're experiencing the things they're experiencing, and then giving them a picture of what the process might look like, big picture, like 30,000 foot view. Mm. Um, and, and it is like uh, assuring them that it is going to be messy, right? Like yeah. <laughs> this, this will be messy. We are going to get into feelings that are uncomfortable. Um, and, and usually there's trust, trust there when I'm working with a client, like as we're walking into this work, but trusting that like you will not be alone in that process, that there is, there is a way, there is a way through it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that this is the way like through it is, (laughs) is to face it. Um, so I think just, Mm -hmm. I think providing a lot of education um, to ease anxieties and Mm -hmm. um, about what the process looks like. Yeah. What are your views on, on working with somebody who to help them through their trauma, but not going back to to them having to experience it or relive it, like to not discuss it, to do it differently. What are your views on that? Mm -hmm. I, so personally, I don't think they have to talk through every detail that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, and with the MDR, a lot of the philosophy is, and what's more important is how, how they have made sense of it. And we do have to speak about the trauma, um, but the impact it had on them, how it's changed the way they see themselves, the thing, the shame and blame and responsibility mm-hmm. and sense of being unsafe. Right. Um, so I think more, what I more focus on in my work is what, um, you know, their, how they have made sense of it, their feelings around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it's important in some way for the story to be witnessed in a safe place. Mm. I like the word witness. Um, yeah. And I got that from IFS, like witnessing, yeah. witnessing the story of the exiles, right? That right. the parts of us that we have exiled that carry our trauma, mm-hmm. um, for those parts to come back to us, they need to know that they're safe and that their story mm-hmm. is important and it matters. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think the way to do that is that the story needs to be told while the client is aware they're in the present moment, that they yeah. aren't. Right. We don't want them to go back totally yeah. to the past. Um, so we do need to find ways to keep them body, mind, emotionally still with us. And that's, mm-hmm. I think that's what EMDR does so well, because mm-hmm. the BLS, the bilateral stimulation helps right. with that. Um, and I think IFS does that well, because it provides a container mm-hmm. for talking right. talking about the, right. the trauma and the burdens. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I really like about IFS, it gives you agency over what's happening within you because you yes. can name the subparts. You can decide yeah. how they feel. You can have, but it can, it, it in a way makes it fun. Mm-hmm. So, and that does diffuse some of the trauma because again, yeah. it puts you back in authority of what's happening to you. Yeah, That so many of the voices we hear within us, because it sounds like us, we think it's us and it's not. Yes. It's really not. You realize it's a part of you. Yeah. That has been functioning to help you survive yeah. in a certain way for a yeah. long time, but that it's yeah. not, that is not your true self or your voice. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There might be a little self and there might be a part of self in there, but it's a part that got hijacked to protect. Yes. And we can't protect and connect. No. I, yeah. I like that. Protect and connect. Can't protect yeah. and connect. Okay. Yeah, we got to choose, right? And there's times it really is okay. I've learned this the hard way. There's times it's really okay to just protect. You're yes. allowed to just protect yourself. Yes. If you are in a not safe situation, you need right. to protect. Yeah. Right. That's right. And then, and, but having PTSD, we don't always know when we're unsafe. Correct. 
we don't always know when there's danger and when to protect and when not to protect. Yeah. And so that is part of why it's so important to see someone like you to start really looking at the dysregulation and figuring out how to trust what we're feeling, yeah. thinking, experiencing. Yes. How to trust it, how to know, um, how to know when to start, start paying attention to your own cues and not the cues from other people. <laughs> yes, that's well said. Yeah. 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 That's well said. Because if, if you grew up in a trauma household or a t- more traditional trauma household, yeah. where the climate is a little bit more toxic, your survival is guessing someone's mood, being aware, knowing the sounds of someone's footsteps. You can tell if they're angry or not. That is your survival. If you continue to do that, it becomes completely your separation from self and other people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, you're not letting yourself relax, be open about who you are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're you're walking around on edge, um, yeah. Because again, yeah. it's about you're just protecting, so it's not about your emotional needs. It's just about how do I get through this moment? Yes. Yeah. 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 And that's I think the difference is when healthy connection is when we're we're validating our needs, validating others' needs, mm-hmm. but we're not we're not putting our feelings on them or putting their feelings right. on us. That's right. So there, there needs to be attention to emotion, like that healthy co-regulation that we're talking about mm-hmm. earlier. Right. That's um, right. but we can't think so often we get over-focused on, like over-focused yeah. on emotion. Yeah. And, and I think it's a great way of putting it for people to take a second when you're hyper-focused on what someone else is thinking or feeling or experiencing. Yeah. And, um, and this is more of an adult. There's times when you are responsible for a child, what they're experiencing, mm-hmm. but adult to adult relationship, that yeah. if you're hyper-focused on that, um, like how old do you feel in the moment? When did you learn yeah. to do that? Yes. All right, because adults don't do that to each other. Yeah. Unless it's something severe, like there's grief or something extreme that's happening in your life. But most of the time that I don't get to decide how you're feeling and I don't have to regulate how you're feeling we can co-regulate together and that that allows connection. Yes. Yeah. 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 So yeah. when, for you, when do you feel the most connected to yourself mm-hmm. and the others? What's happening that helps you feel the most connected? A couple of things. So singing, that is a time where I feel really connected. And I think that's, so I grew up doing choir. My family were very mm-hmm. musical and that's, I feel very connected to them when we're like singing together. The holidays are really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And singing that regulates, regulates your, your vagal. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Put you in ventral vagal. So uh, that's always been a nice, nice coping thing that I've had. Um, Mm -hmm. I think laugh, like laughing with friends. That's one of my favorite. Yeah. I feel most relaxed. Like when I know I'm with safe people Mm -hmm. um, and being outside, there, there are a couple, like when I'm outside as well, um, I usually feel very connected. Water is something that is very soothing for me, like mm-hmm. being near water. Um, right. And um, and then also, I, I know sh- you shared this in my bio, but um, dancing with people is one of my favorite things. Really? That's yeah. Great. Yeah. So on a dance floor at, at a wedding, a party, and I take dance classes too. So I think, and that's that, I think that body experience of getting out of your mind mm. where you're just, you're mm. being with, being with people. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great exercise for people to do. Yeah. Just to think for a second, if you stood up wherever you are right now and just let your body shake, yeah. like just the idea of it, does that panic you? Or do you immediately think that's stupid? Cause that's your protection is to think it's stupid. Or is it yeah. something that you're willing to do and to see, and like, will you let yourself really get loose with it, you know, um, yeah. so that you can pay attention to your body. But people's reaction to things like that really can indicate, you know, where you are. If you got taught it was okay, that your body That's, was safe. Yeah. Um, I love when, you know, in like a group event, if they ask you to stand up and move around and some people are just like, no, yeah. I don't want to do it there. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> they, yeah. Totally yeah. don't want to let go. Yeah. Right. And you don't know what's happened, how triggering that is to people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of why um, it's interesting the therapist because everything I can think, say, or do, I know is going to trigger somebody. Mm. And I have to, right, we have to live and just do it anyway. But there's so much trauma. There's so much there that anything can be a trigger when you have PTSD. Yes. Initially, when you have PTSD, 
before you get recovery, everything is a trigger. Yes. And so many of us are walking around not even realizing we're being triggered because we're in that constant state of stress. Very true. So we all need to be checking in with our bodies more. <laughs> yeah. What they're and listen to what they're trying to tell us. Right. And if, right. You, if there's resistance there, yeah. then to, to talk with somebody about it. Yeah. You know, I yeah. view it as, I explained to my patients, is that you, you, I'm sure you see a little kid and they grab mom's pants and they go, mom, 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 mom. And they just get louder and more persistent yeah. if the mom doesn't pay attention. Or our bodies do the same. Our emotions do the same. And so if we don't pay attention, then it, it does become an eating disorder. It does become... It does Addiction. evolve into codependency. Yeah. Like it comes, it becomes that you're drinking more than you realize. Like things start happening to your body. You start getting sick. Things are happening to try to get your attention to let you know that something's not okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. what, what final words of wisdom before we go into the hot seat, we're going to throw you in the hot seat in a second. Oh. Would you have for um, anyone who may be having some relational difficulties or seeing some patterns within them? Do they feel a little bit stuck? What would you say to them? I would say talk, talk to someone. Doesn't have to be a therapist, mm. but don't listen to the shame. There, there's right. probably shame in your head saying yeah. like you're doing something wrong. You're having the struggle in your life and and there's something wrong with you. But to speak about it in a safe place. Mm-hmm. And that's that in and of itself is a huge step towards starting to reconnect with yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And um, so I'd say to open up and then start to learn what you're feeling, why you're feeling that way and what you need. I come back to that all the time. Those like three questions mm-hmm. with clients of what you're feeling, why, and what do you need? And it's such a simple process, but the more we do that, we're gaining, we're gaining the wisdom of our bodies back yeah. and we're get, getting our voice back. Yeah. And and that's going to give us insight to break patterns, to walk into situations that are are healthy and good for us. Yeah. Um, take responsibility. Um, yeah. So that would be my my final words. Yeah, I love that. It is about taking responsibility and checking in with self instead of expecting someone else to take care of you, do something yes. for you. The first yes. second, checking in with self. That's part of the yeah. co-regulation. That's really good. Yeah. All right. Well, you've been great. I'm going to throw you in the hot seat real quick. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay. <laughs> and just whatever comes to mind first. Okay. Is what I want you to just put out there. Okay. So what comes to mind first when you hear the word vulnerability? Renee Brown. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Of course. Yeah. She's made vulnerability cool. Yes, she has. Yeah. Um, Renee Brown and, um, but also... comes to mind with vulnerability is I think it's it's doing things like this for me is like speaking speaking about mm-hmm. myself um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah that in a more public like giving talks or <laughs> right. being on a podcast that's right. very vulnerable for yeah. me <laughs> yeah no I yeah. appreciate you doing it I mean yeah because you know Brene Brown's the one that said that vulnerability is the antidote to shame and so it's yes. just really really true and that yeah. You know, we have shame about our stories and we believe we are the story. Yes. Not the, the, the repurposing that comes from the story, right? We won't, we won't let the repurposing come because we'll just be ashamed of our story. And so, yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is on your nightstand? We have two nightstands. <laughs> and I think right now there's about, there's two journals. <laughs> Mary Oliver, a Mary Oliver collection and three books, hmm. um, the burnout book, uh-huh. um, that's recent by Emily, Emily Nagoski and her, Emily and Amelia Nagoski. It's a great yeah, book I know about, exactly what you're yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, the stress. So the burnout book, um, a leadership book and there's another book that's on there. Oh, um, forgiving what you can't forget. I think it's, um, Turkers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then um, Aquaphor because my hands always get so dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that that's your answer because I have Developing the Mind by Dr. Dan Siegel, 
a polyvagal book by Deb, yeah. Deb uh, on my bedside. And I would never, I mean, talk about vulnerable. I would never tell somebody that. Like, how nerdy yeah. is that? Yeah. Right. I don't <laughs> tell people stuff like that about me. Right. That's ridiculous. Yes. And I don't I, ruin, my, ruin my reputation or anything. So we'll, yeah. we'll just move on from this question. All okay. right. <laughs> All right. If you could give yourself a new name, a different name, what would it be? Um, so I've always wanted to, I, I like, I want to change the spelling of my name. I've thought of Elise spelling it A-L-I-X. I love that. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Um, you can, yeah. I wouldn't actually change it, but I've always thought about, that's a real, I saw it spelled that way. And I was like, that's a really cool way to spell Elise. Would you not spell it that way because of your parents? No, just probably convenience. Yeah. Because <laughs> so. you're a little busy. You're a little yeah. busy. Yeah. And All I right. Love, I love my name, but yeah. I really love that, like that just spelling is a little edgier. It is edgy. I like it. Yeah. I like it a lot. All right. What is your favorite food? Um, dark chocolate. Yeah. That's the whole the food group right there. That's all yeah. you need. Well, there's so many different things that you can have with dark chocolate. So, right. Yeah. Like a fork. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What What is your favorite quote? Oh, um, um, I really like, um, I really like a quote. It's John Kabat-Zinn. Um, the one between, between stimulus and response, oh, there is yeah, a space. Yeah. And in that space is our power to choose. Right. Yeah. And in our power to choose is our, I, I may have flipped is like, that's no, you our, growth, you did. our growth and freedom. I that's really right. love that quote. No, you said it perfectly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that quote. I use it in a lot of my, um, there's a certain talk I do that, and I use that because it just encompasses it. Like it just, yeah. it, there's so much freedom in that yeah. quote. That's a beautiful quote. Yeah. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. All right. Last one. And this is not a trick question. What okay. is your favorite podcast? Um, my favorite podcast. I've really been enjoying Flip Your Lid. Um, See, it's the right answer. You didn't have to give yes. that answer, but it is the right answer. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. This is a very hard question for me. People who know me know that I love podcasts. Um, I really, I, I like Invisibilia. Can I give you three? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Invisibilia. Um, Dear Sugar, it's, they don't make any new episodes, but it's like a guilty pleasure podcast for me because it's, it's self-help, but like, I love it. <laughs> and I yeah. love Cheryl Strayed. Um, and then I, um, I loved Dolly Parton's America. It was just mm. a series, but that was a super fun podcast. It made oh, okay. me, I had never thought I was a Dolly Parton fan. And then I listened to it and I was like, oh my gosh, she's incredible. So, yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. She is. That's great. I recommend. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're also incredible. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I'm sure some people would want to get in touch with you. Can you kind of throw out whether it's an Instagram handle or is there a website? How can people find out more about you? Yeah. So um, I, my Instagram is Elise M. Howell and that's my therapist Instagram. I, I don't update it that much, but it is a way to contact me. And then um, to contact me at my therapy practice, it's at southeastpsych.com. Um, and you can contact me through through our website. So that's where I, I practice here in Charlotte. Well, that is great. Hey, thank you so yeah. much for being a part of the Charlotte community yeah. and helping people when it comes in the stigma against mental health and being a part of Flip Your Lid today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, thank you. All right, wonderful audience. I know you've heard something today that flipped your lid. And our prayer for you is that you're able to reconnect to who God says that you are. Please take care of yourself and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Please subscribe, rate, and share. You can find Kim on Facebook or Instagram at KB Honeycutt. To get an autographed copy of Kim's book, visit butyourmotherlovesyou.com. Remember, no matter what, treat yourself well today. <laughs>